Good day, Global Fitness friends. Yes, Global, we have some close to 400 participants here today in this webinar from no, not only from Europe, but also from the Americas, from Asia Pacific and from other parts of the world. My name is Herman Rutgers, and on behalf of Europe Active and Deloitte, I would welcome you very warmly to Brussels, where we're streaming this live webinar. Uh, I'm here with my good old partner, Carsten Hollasch, partner and head of the consumer and private equity business in Deloitte. In previous years, you've seen us both on the stage in the European Health and Fitness Forum, the event prior to the largest fitness show in the world, FIBO in Cologne. But this year we are doing it a little bit different. And the reason is that we had last year some problems with getting timely data from particularly stock market listed companies, from other organizations that were doing some research locally. And this year we have delayed our presentation of this report by one month in order to have the optimum in terms of uh, data information. This will be the 10th report that we do together and it covers the calendar year 2022. It is more complete than ever with 178 pages of valuable information and includes key findings from our special consumer research, which was conducted this year in January 23, as well as last year. So we can compare the two and Carson will talk later about that. We have about 30 countries in the report and 25 key operators. This report really reflects Europe Active's effort to further strengthen its position as the knowledge center for the European health and fitness market by providing reliable and sound market data. I would like, uh, before we start, thank the team at Deloitte in Dusseldorf, the six people who've worked uh, very hard and done their utmost to make this timely and the best uh, report ever. So thank you for that team. We have one hour available here for this webinar um, and Carsten and I will take you through uh, the highlights of the report. And then we will leave about 15 to 20 minutes at the end for live Q and A. So please use your uh, Q and A function on Zoom for that. And we will address those questions as they come in. One last comment, all participants to this webinar can go to the Europe Active website tomorrow where you can find the recording of this webinar and you can also download the PowerPoint presentation. So without further ado, Carsten, uh, please uh, kick it off and uh, toy, toy, toy. Thank you, Amon, and pleasure to be here and to do it all virtually and gives a lot of uh, opportunity to all people around the world to come to our webinar and get the information on the European Health and Fitness Report 2023. First of all, uh, we would like to thank all the sponsors at the right uh, who made it possible to fund such a, such a research, a research because it's quite uh, extensive. As you know, uh, we have reached out to many countries, as Emma said, there's a lot of work going into that and it makes it fundamental to have the right numbers to speak to the public and also to financial institutions. So this uh, webinar will be structured into five parts. I will do four parts of it, um, spending some time how the markets have developed, uh, specifically the operators here. We have a focus on 10 biggest operators, both in terms of memberships, but also in terms of revenue. We will again have a look at the M&A market uh, last year, how it compares to the previous years, what were the major transactions, and then, as Hermann already uh, introduced, uh, we have done a consumer survey, uh, which we will introduce uh, to you in the main findings uh, that is very recently done in January. And then Hermann will end it up and summarize it and we'll talk about the ecosystem. First of all, when it comes to the markets uh, here, so um, the good news is that the membership uh, have returned uh, to nearly to 2019, so pre-corona levels. So if you look at the numbers from last year compared to this year, um, the membership has grown by 12%, adding up to a total of 63 million members in those countries surveyed. Um, there was a side development of clubs. So we have seen a lot of single operators uh, caused also by the financial difficulties around the corona crisis, the lockdowns, et cetera, who have shut down their clubs, but we also have seen still some openings of major fitness operators, and we will come to that when we discuss the top 10 operators. 
What does it mean in revenue? Uh, the revenue have um, um, over increased by the members. Uh, one of the reason was that partly 2021 uh, was uh, affected by uh, club closures. And obviously uh, there were no revenues uh, accounted uh, in that period, but the revenues were deferred. And therefore, if you just look at the revenues compared at the membership, um, there is an overproportionate increase from uh, nearly 70 million last year to 28. Also here, the good news is that um, the total revenues have achieved a level of uh, those were in 2019. How does that uh, relate to, to the major markets? So we have here taken four major markets being Germany, UK, Spain, and France. Uh, what you see here first is uh, in terms of membership, uh, you also see uh, that there is a picture uh, like in the overall uh, sample, but it, it's a bit of differentiating how the membership have evolved over time here over these three years under consideration, uh, um, mainly a reason because uh, the countries do have different uh, membership contract periods, which do affect um, the cancellation during disclosure uh, to wider or to a lesser extent. If you look at revenues um, here, again, uh, a reflection, uh, the memberships and also the closure in the respective years. Um, and um, obviously, as we all know, the closures have happened differently in the different countries. So therefore, the effect on the revenues uh, being different here. So when we look at the uh, top operators here, um, that will be, as you uh, used to see in the previous reports, a separate chapter on it. Um, here we have highlighted the top 10 operators um, led by basic fit um, and then RSG group, pure germ, FITX, um, et cetera. Um, those add up to a total of approximately 12 million members uh, compared to the total market. That means that these top 10 operators account for approximately 20% to be precise, 19% of the total European membership. If you compare that to other markets like retail, for example, um, this is still uh, not a very consolidated market. So also from other things we're going to see and discuss further, we anticipate that a further consolidation in the market will happen and that this uh, share of the top operators in terms of the total European membership market will increase. If you see um, on the right side, we have compared the component average growth rates or the CAGR, uh, the European market versus the top 10. So you see the European market has grown compared to last year by 12.3% versus the top 10 by 20%. So here again shows the consolidation of the top 10 in terms of membership growth. If you look at the next slide, uh, that shows the operators in terms of revenue. So there's a slightly different setup um, in the composition of the 10 operators. Newfield Health and uh, L'Orange Bleu um, haven't been on the top 10 by members, but there are because of the higher membership fees belong the top 10 by revenue. And you also have seen that David Lloyd has increased to the second place, whereas Basic Fit is still the biggest operator also in terms of revenue. If you look at the far right then, uh, you will see that uh, the European market um, compared to previous year has increased significantly by revenue um, by 65.9%, whereas the top 10 operators only have increased by 59%. I'm saying only because if you look at the top 10 operators, seven out of the 10 are in the value for money slash discount or budget segment, whereas the other are in the mid to premium segment. So that explains obviously the difference here, why the top 10 operators are underproportionately grown. If you just take the revenues of the top 10 operators, again, a reflection of the sample here being seven out of 10 in the budget segment, only 14% of the European club revenues uh, do consolidate within this 10, here versus the approximately 20% if you look just at the members. So let's have a look at the uh, specific um, uh, members, uh, sorry, operators here. Um, and, and we have uh, picked out a basic fit and SATS. 
because we also got very uh, recent information uh, from, from them. So for example, if you take basic fit and you take the Q1 report that just published, um, they just confirmed their goal for the entire fiscal year 23 um, to achieve at least 1 billion in terms of revenues. Um, they have by end of March opened a total of 1,268 clubs and that adds up to 3.6 million members. Uh, SATs uh, also have um, reported uh, very good numbers uh, compared to, um, to Q1. Uh, so they have grown by, by 19% to 102 million euro. The numbers you see here on the right are in Norwegian Krona. So that translates uh, in Q1 into 102 million euro. And that is um, uh, a basis of 703,000 uh, members. Um, the price increase also has um, seen here at basic fit. Uh, so we will discuss that later that we have seen many operators with price increases lately. Basic fit have increased their prices from 20 to 25 euro in uh, starting 1st of January for new members. And that's also reflected then here obviously in the revenues and will come more uh, if those members uh, will then increase over time. Uh, but we also have seen other operators like, for example, Arctic or Pure Gym, uh, both grown in terms of membership. And also, if we look um, across the Atlantic Ocean, other operators like Planet Fitness, et cetera, have grown uh, in the first quarter. And that's a good sign of um, the coming back of the market here. When we look at M&A, obviously, M&A is a trigger for, for changes, for transformation. And uh, the M&A market overall has been obviously affected by, by various topics. So there was macroeconomic and political uncertainty, uh, which led to the fact that um, uh, mergers and acquisition have gone down, but they have come back again, like in the financial crisis back in the years 2008, 2009, very quickly. Uh, and the markets are very affluent uh, um, again. And if we look at the transactions which happened uh, last year in, in 2022, uh, it's a slightly lower number than compared to previous years, uh, but driving those uh, transactions have been by strategic investors, so really the corporate players in the market who further consolidated the market, uh, but also still by private equity slash uh, financial investors. So you see that the 13 transactions happening were driven by strategic investors, nine, and out of which then uh, additional four by the financial investors by being private equity. When we look at the uh, major transactions happen in 2022, uh, there was uh, one uh, transaction happened uh, at Cisco, which is um, um, a group uh, consisting of Enjoy Elements and further brands have been the sold. Being sold. Let's see if the echo is gone. Yeah, it's gone. Uh, so they, uh, Lafayette has um, acquired 172 clubs um, being uh, franchise and own clubs. Uh, the second transaction we have seen uh, is also consolidation by uh, Medicover, uh, which is uh, a Swedish uh, insurance company. They have acquired a number of clubs here and consolidated the market in, in, in Poland. Uh, furthermore, um, we, we've seen uh, LifeFit Group taking over two uh, separate chains, uh, being in shape and fitness loft in um, adding further brands and further offering to their multi-brand strategy. Last but not least, uh, there were multiple operators uh, in Norway consolidated by Credo Partners, uh, also a financial investor who stayed in there and remains uh, to be a majority shareholder to the group. And I should have shot this uh, before, but you have listened, uh, I think, to my words and that's showing uh, the four transactions here. Uh, last but not least, uh, we always have the slide for the uh, stock market. And what you see here is that also the, the brands here listed on the stock exchange uh, reporting uh, good numbers, um, in, especially in the first quarter, have been uh, coming back and also showing a good performance uh, on the stock market. My last point here for this presentation uh, will be to discuss the consumer survey. Um, the consumer survey 
um, as we have presented also briefly um, already in Cologne, um, is a representative um, survey of approximately 11,000 participants uh, aging 16 years and above. Uh, the survey has been conducted in 19 European countries and um, it is very recently published and recently be surveyed uh, in January 2023. Um, again, here also, um, thanks to the sponsors of this survey, which is the President's Council for Operators organized by, by Europe Active. Uh, without them, uh, this survey, which we have now conducted for the second time, uh, would not be uh, possible. So one of the uh, questions we have asked um, the, uh, the participants is where do they really um, perform uh, their fitness activity? And uh, they had three choices. Uh, one is obviously train out in a club, which you can see uh, on the top left, then exclusively exercise at home or exclusively exercise outdoor. So you see 15% do exclusively work out in a club, 24 at home and 15 outdoor. More interestingly is the combination of the three, because what we also have seen uh, during the lockdown period and Corona is uh, the further offerings of club operators to offer home exercise uh, virtually to their members, but also outdoor classes, which were not affected by, by the shutdowns. And when we look at those, um, you see that especially the combination of club-based exercise and home-based exercise um, has grown and also uh, the combination of the three, meaning that we are moving more and more into, um, into um, an omni-channel uh, way of performing fitness uh, than it was before. So really Corona has transformed uh, also the fitness behavior of the consumers, of the members. And I think going forward, they will also seek uh, to have experience which is wider than just uh, at one of the three choices shown here on this chart. Another chart uh, we wanted to share with you and that's uh, been taken out of a survey uh, Deloitte is doing on a monthly basis. So we are surveying people um, about their um, uh, um, sentiment around uh, inflation uh, by, for example, the macroeconomic environment, by the political environment, and where they really are trying to, to save costs. And you see here from the left, um, there is a high impact on energy utility. Obviously, people can choose how warm or how hot they have it at their home so they can reduce the energy that also relates obviously to, to showering, uh, the duration, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also of uh, spending like in restaurants, entertainment, travel, and holidays. Uh, the good news here is that you see that the fitness club activities are to a least extent um, concerned here and therefore um, also in, in, in high inflation uh, um, periods, uh, the people tend not to uh, terminate their fitness club membership, whereas they try to save money um, in other um, um, spending areas like, like mentioned before, energy, et cetera, et cetera. So how can we summarize this uh, consumer survey here? For this, we have uh, taken six uh, key takeaways uh, from it. Obviously, um, there is again, an increase in number of regularly active fitness practitioners. Uh, the fitness club uses shows the most positive development among, among fitness set settings. So we see that rebound, uh, especially in the fitness clubs and also shown by the Q1 numbers again of the major operators and also the market uh, is coming back. There's a combination of home, outdoor and club-based fitness, and this will be continued to be, uh, to be used complementary. So I think it's also important that when you are an operator to think about what you can offer in terms of home and outdoor fitness uh, for your members. Um, the fitness club users uh, do use uh, digital workout planning tools. 
uh, to organize a fitness club visit. That has also uh, been coming up during Corona when um, the clubs were then reopened, but they had to limit the capacity and the volume of people training out. And therefore these apps have been created and those apps do, prefer, do, um, uh, do present a, um, an advantage uh, to the members now in planning which courses they want to visit, et cetera, et cetera. Um, driven by non-paid offerings, especially coming from the Corona period, the usage of digital tools and home fitness has increased, and we see that to be continued. Uh, so that's a factor which should be uh, really into the prices uh, included um, when you offer a membership. And last, um, compared to other expenditure categories, fitness club activities are less impacted by inflation-related budget costs, as we just have seen by our latest survey we have, have taken. With that, um, I uh, leave the numbers aside and hand over to Hermann again for the ecosystem. Thank you, Karsten. When um, Dr. Jan Middelkamp and, and I self made the first uh, graph of the ecosystem of the fitness sector, um, it was very different from this one. And as you can see, and some of you may have seen this before, um, but it's changing constantly and the lines between the categories is blurring. On the left hand side, bottom side, you see outdoor, then you see indoor, which includes fitness clubs in various uh, segments, as well as hotels and corporate fitness. And then you see the segment digital, and then you see the segment uh, suppliers. And at the center, you see the consumer. And the consumer can choose more and more options today in order to be physically active. And what, what we've seen is that operators are, are expanding. Um, Carson talked about uh, growth in the sector. Operators are going to new markets, different countries. But in, in, in general, we see that, uh, for instance, Technogym, a supplier, is also offering connected home fitness equipment. We see Basic Fit, who is an operator, is also offering a connected home fitness uh, bike. So there is a lot of cross-section and interaction between the various elements of this ecosystem. As in, as in any ecosystem, there's a lot of cross-input between the various elements of this ecosystem, and it's growing all the time. Um, what, what we see uh, also is in a recent statistic from Statistica, and the app market, the fitness app market, has grown tremendously. It was valued last year, 2022, at 3.2 billion euros in size, which was a 24% increase from the year before. So we see an enormous business also in the digital apps. In the report, you will find an extensive chapter with an in-depth analysis of the whole ecosystem uh, comprising of 28 pages. So um, without further ado, I will move to the next slide. And here we asked uh, in our uh, survey of major operators in Europe, we asked them how they felt about the current business climate. And as you can see here, the good they feel good about the prospects of the business is 60%. And you see that 33% 30, is saying that it's satisfactory and only a small percentage is saying that they, the outlook is uh, not so good. So overall, a very positive outlook by operators on, on the business. We also asked them questions about the energy cost. Of course, we've all seen the tsunami of rising costs in energy. And as you see from this uh, chart, that 90% of the operators said, yes, we had an increase in our energy cost. I'm sure that the 10% who did not indicate they had an increase had locked in contracts at lower prices. And I'm sure that they will have an increase uh, in, the, uh, in the year to come. The other question we asked operators was, how did you evolve your prices in 2022? And as you can see, uh, and we asked them for one month contracts as well as for 12 month contracts. And as you can see here, in both cases, the answer was from 60% of the operators that they did increase their prices and 40% uh, did not increase their prices in 2022. Uh, but we know that since that time, 
operators have increased prices starting 2023. Just to give you some examples on that, uh, McFit was the first to raise prices in 2022 in April last year, um, and also by 25%, by the way, and other operators in Germany, like Fitness First, Fitix, um, and uh, Migros raised their prices. Sats in the Nordics uh, announced an average price uh, sales per member of up to 11% in the first quarter of this year, after price increases last year and at the beginning of this year. And as a result, their membership yield was up by 15% for the first quarter of 23. So very good, uh, good evolution there. Basic Fit um, did not increase their prices in 22, but raised their starting price from 1999 to 2499 at the start of 2023. And the premium membership was increased by five euros to 29.99. So we see that all of the operators, the main operators, have been forced to raise their prices because of rising not only energy cost, but also big rises in labor costs and also uh, costs in rising of their rents. Um, we also asked the operators around the corporate sustainability reporting. As you know, um, in the European Union, as of 2024, all stock market listed companies, but also major companies, will have to report on their sustainability uh, specific goals in their net CO2 uh, targets. And this applies, of course, also to fitness. And we asked two questions to our uh, panel. Uh, one was, does your company have a CSR strategy, e.g. on sustainability goals, measurement of energy savings and CO2 reduction? And the other question was, does your company have a plan to become carbon neutral? And on the left-hand side, you see the answers to the first question were 8% um, said they are already compliant in terms of uh, CO2 uh, targets, 25% plans for 2030 or earlier, 17% between 2031 and 2040, and 13% between 2041 and 2050. 38%, uh, as you can see, has not yet defined a goal, but they definitely will have to, uh, will have to do that. And on the right-hand side, you see the targets for achieving the, uh, the net zero uh, carbon question, which I just um, alluded to. Intermediaries is a topic that has been much debated, but very little researched. And what we did was ask the consumer panel, 11,000 people we interviewed, what are you using fitness through an intermediary? And as you can see here in 2023, this year, 13% said, yes, we do use an intermediary to be physically active. That was up from 9% the year before. So a big increase in terms of the consumers who say that they are using intermediaries. And the, the most developed market for intermediaries is Germany. And in Germany, uh, Deloitte has done a lot of work on trying to define that market and get a better idea about that market. And this is the number for 2022. As you can see, uh, the total value through uh, aggregators or intermediaries was estimated at 240 million euros in 2022 which was an increase of roughly 10% versus the year before. There were 27,500 um, uh, partners in, in the locations. And of course, some will have multiple locations and 540,000 memberships through the intermediaries in fitness. That means if you uh, look at the German market where we have counted 10.3 million members, there is about uh, half five percent, half a million members that can be added to the market if we include the intermediary. So a very interesting development. And in the report, we have a chapter on this where you will see on the various countries which intermediaries are active and uh, which countries they are active. So you will have more information on that in the report. Summarizing the key takeaways of this year's market report, first of all, 
uh, we've seen a strong rebound. Uh, the market has really bounced back after two very difficult years due to COVID-19 with closures up to six months each year uh, in various uh, European countries. But I think those who predicted the demise of the brick and mortar clubs and the death of brick and mortar clubs and the online presence of the pelotons and the likes have proven to be terribly wrong. And we now see that the customer really wants to come back to the clubs, wants to be in a social environment and wants to have multiple options to train on rather than just a bike or a treadmill at home. And we've seen, of course, in the numbers that Carson just showed that many customers do both. Secondly, we can see that the market growth is expected to continue. Carson already mentioned several key operators who published their first quarter uh, results, which were very good. But also, there is quite a few uh, companies that have announced uh, aggressive growth plans. Basic Fit announced they will open this year 200 new clubs. The, uh, the gym group is opening new clubs. Pure Gym has announced to open 40 new clubs this calendar year. And also Sats, Anytime Fitness, and David Lloyd all have announced expansion plans. Um, so that is both well for the uh, expected uh, growth. The third one that I would like to mention is the cost increases. Of course, uh, several operators, as I just shown, have been forced to raise their prices in order to pass on their increased expenses. Uh, but it seems that the consumer uh, has been understanding that growth of, uh, of the price and has been accepting that price. Otherwise, we would not have seen such uh, tremendous growth in terms of the number of members. Number four, market consolidation. <clears throat> As Carson did show, the total of the top 10 operators in Europe only account for 14% of the market. So the market is far from really consolidated and we still have a lot of expectation on that the consolidation in the market will continue as well as that the ecosystem will continue to evolve. In terms of the number five, the hybrid use, uh, we've seen here that uh, customers do like to do not just one thing, but multiple things in their fitness settings. And the good news is that in our consumer research, we've seen that the consumer uh, mostly has bounced back in terms of the health club usage, which went up 4% in January 23 versus a year ago. And that is a very positive sign for all the club operators. And last but not least, the European penetration of fitness membership has grown to almost 8%. If we look at uh, the, we also have in the report, the percentage of 15 plus is 9.5%. So close to 10% of Europeans of 15 years and older are practicing in fitness through a membership. Now, as you all know, Europe Active has as a overall mantra to grow to 100 million members by 2030. And with the slump in the two corona years, one could question, is that still a feasible number? And we believe that it still is a feasible number for a number of reasons. On this graph, you see that we ended 22 with 64 million members. And in order to grow to 100 million, the simple arithmetic is that you need to grow 5.8% per annum in order to get to 100 million by 2030. That is a growth that has been achieved. If we look at the years be between uh, 2019 and 2010, nine years before Corona, that was exactly the percentage that was achieved in the European market. And we believe that in terms of the penetration rates that are relatively low, in some key markets like France, like Spain, like Italy, some Eastern European markets where the penetration rate is below the European average, there is very good growth possible in this sector. Also, there is a lot of very creative and very entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurs in our, in our sector who will come up with new ways and new ideas to en entice more people to join our industry. And, of course, everybody's talking about exercise as medicine. We have seen during Corona, every cloud has a silver lining, as the saying goes. We've seen that people now understand better that if you are fit and you're in good health, you are less susceptible to uh, viruses and you have more chances of uh, staying through 
uh, any any corona crisis that uh, may occur again in the future, God forbid. In terms of the, the other sector, prevention is key. Exercises, medicine is more and more prevalent. Governments are more spending money on prevention. And our, our industry is very well positioned to, to be that um, the provider of services in terms of providing people with a preventative exercise in order to stay healthy and to stay fit. So that um, brings us to the end of our uh, presentation. Here you see on this slide, the uh, report is now available for sale. Uh, you can order it in two ways through the Europe Active website. Here is the link. You can, uh, with your phone, uh, copy this QR code on the screen right now, and then you can directly go to the website and order it. Uh, it is priced at the same price. We have not increased our prices, uh, contrary to many people in our sector. We've stayed at the same price, 199 euros for Europe Active members. And those who are not yet a member, they have to pay the price for that, of course. They pay 200 euros more um, for the report. But it's all value, um, very, very high value for that very low price. So we now have time for some questions from the audience. And let's have a look at uh, what questions came in. I see here a question from Marcel Fricar. Consumer survey slide 19. What's the definition of practice fitness? Does it include generic sports like running, cycling, etc.? Thank you. I think the answer is yes, it does include running, cycling, any physical activity. So it's really physical activity in the broader sense. So I hope that answers your question. That's right. And it uh, qualifies for being physical active if you do it at least once a week, which is obviously uh, not a big achievement, to be honest, but it's uh, uh, so everybody who is practicing it once a week um, that has been qualified as a yes answer. Yeah. There is here a question from Mark Lauder. He says, why is there nothing in the report about impact wellness is having on the industry? Well, it's a good question, Mark, but that's beyond the scope of uh, the report. I can tell you that there is another report that Europe Active is championing, and that is the socioeconomic value of the sector. And that will address exactly this question, but the scope of this annual market report is really to measure the evolution of the market, the number of members, number of clubs, what's happening in the ecosystem, uh, that is the focus of the market report. The other report that you're uh, alluding to will come out uh, later later this year, probably around September, October time. So yes, a very important element to address, but not the scope of this report. That's the socioeconomic value report that will come out later. We have another question from Ikas Demir. Is it included Turkey in the market data? The answer is yes, we have Turkey in the data. And we have a country uh, coverage of Turkey in the report, which you will see when you uh, will have uh, a visibility of the report. We have an anonymous question. When will the ones that bought the report during FIBO receive it and how? <laughs> well, that's, that's a very practical question. We will get back to you uh, on that. But I'm sure the report as of today uh, will be printed. So if you've ordered a printed version, that will be shipped to you in the next two weeks, I would say. If you have ordered a PDF version, that will be sent to you, shipped to you in the next day or two. So very quick delivery. Then uh, David Heathcote, are there demographic segments which are currently under represent, re represented in club memberships, which will contribute to the 100 million target? Maybe Carsten, that's a nice one for you. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I mean, it's obviously dependent when you look the average ages by operator. So um, you will see average ages depending on the average spending per club member. So the premium and the upper medium clubs tend to have older members, uh, but it's also related to the offerings. So it tends to be more in the physiotherapeutic healthcare direction than also the members tend to be older. 
uh, obviously, if you have um, this uh, offering like uh, Basic Fit uh, or FitX in Germany, our ski group, et cetera, those will tend to be uh, younger. And um, I mean, I do see potential on both uh, in both age groups. So I still see potential in the younger age groups, but I also see potential, especially in the older groups. Uh, and um, Hermann mentioned something about health prevention by doing more sports. And that could obviously also be a, a good formula to it. Uh, so yes, uh, we do see difference depending on the operator you're looking at, but we do see also uh, potential in growing um, to become uh, or to, to get to the 100 million members uh, in all club segments here. Thank you. A question from Francois Petit. What about interactions between independent coaches and fitness clubs? Well, of course, the fitness coaches are a very important element of the ecosystem. Um, it is very hard to put a value on uh, what is the what is the the value of uh, personal training in the industry. In many uh, clubs, the personal training revenue is included in the revenues. In many other ones, uh, it is not. Uh, some operators use third party uh, trainers in their clubs, and they charge their own revenues to the members. So it's not visible in the total revenues. I would say that personal training is extremely important. The coaches are very important. Many people uh, still struggle to find fitness enjoyable, but with a good coach, you can really find joy in your, in your exercise and the coach can help you better to achieve your goals than if you would not have a coach. We also see a trend that coaches are not just live coaches in the clubs or going outdoors with a coach, but also online. And there's a lot of personal training happening online through Zoom, people staying at home and the coach uh, interacting with the customer uh, through a Zoom link um, that is happening. So absolutely, the interaction between coaches and fitness clubs is, is very important. And in addition, and obviously, awesome. there are a lot of apps uh, which allow the uh, coach to communicate with its uh, with his or her, um, let's say, um, um, client. And so they can have phone calls and then uh, they, the clients practice their, 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 their hours and then it's going to be, let's say, controlled and uh, checked by, by the coach online. Another question here is, are you planning to include outdoor gyms into your reports in the future? Well, we, as long as we get the revenue recognition, we can include them. Right now, several club operators do offer outdoor activities and that's included in the pricing structure. So it is included in part, but it will be very hard to pinpoint. I mean, we, we do have, of course, uh, people like uh, park, uh, uh, park Run in the UK, there is British medical, uh, British military fitness. There, there, there is some outdoor activities that we can pinpoint in terms of the specific revenues from that, but it is included in the overall revenue uh, for now. Um, then uh, is there anything on the report referring to differences between premium and low cost offerings in the different versions? I'm not sure if I understand the different versions, but obviously, yes, uh, if we look at the various operators who do stand for either premium mid-market or low cost slash value for money operators, uh, you will see here the differences in terms of pricing, offerings, etc. cetera. Uh, not sure what is meant by different versions, but uh, you maybe can uh, uh, send another question and we will answer that. Yeah, yeah. In Another question is from Emma Delahaye. Do you know if studios and boutique gyms are suffering of the fact that a lot of people are practicing with apps, yoga, for example, or, are, or they have returned to the same situation as before COVID? I mean, uh, just referring, we have done a very uh, intense research together with uh, the Deutsche Hochschule für Prävention und Gesundheit plus the German Fitness Association. And uh, what that has revealed is that the boutique gyms and the smaller operators who do operate in a yoga or a similar environment really had difficulties in order to survive uh, the corona lockdown, the lockdown period. So I think uh, those studios have been affected twice, uh, one by using more apps, and second, obviously, 
by uh, not being able to maintain their openings and, and record revenues, and then obviously got all the cost spendings going forward. So without the financial background, a lot of those boutique gyms have uh, gone away. Um, maybe they come back, but uh, we have seen last year that especially those studios have been closed. I think the, uh, one comment I could make on that, the stock market listed company is Exponential Fitness, uh, just published their first quarter report, uh, and they're mainly in the US. They have some clubs outside of the US, but mainly in the US. Um, they've done extremely well, uh, and, and that company is doing extremely well. So they're in yoga, they're in Pilates, they're in boxing. So if you check them out, you can look at their numbers. So they're, they're doing very well. Um, I think in, in, in general, uh, all of the segments of the industry have bounced back uh, very well in the first quarter of this year and during 2022. We have another question here. Is there a similar report for the North American market or at least the intention to do something similar? Well, we, we have already our hands full with producing this report for the European market. We have no intention to producing anything for the North American market, but I would contact URSA to see if they have plans to do a report uh, for 2022 or this year. We don't know. So I have to disappoint you there. Uh, apologies, there was a typo. The question is, is there anything on the report referring to differences between premium and low cost offerings in different regions? So we have obviously uh, some details, but the details have not been shown in the report as far as I know, uh, meaning that how much is premium, how much is low cost, how much is uh, mid uh, market here in the various uh, countries. So that's that detail is not specifically included. What, what, what one can say uh, without being very scientific or very, very uh, accurate, in general, you see growth of uh, uh, let's say budget clubs in the markets that we have uh, interviewed um, and you also see growth in the premium and the boutique segment I think it's the middle market where there is a little bit more difficulty in, in bouncing back and and as Carson showed the slide on the top 10 in the report you'll see the top 25 you can see there that a lot of those companies that are in the top uh, particularly a number of members are our budget clubs and if um, you look yes yeah Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. If you look at the country reports then, which are then included, uh, you will obviously have an overview of the top operators in the country. And then it's very easily to find out which is budget, which is premium, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, a question here from the Mar Marco B. Chica. From the consumer survey, what are the demographical characteristics, age, BMI, et cetera, of the new joiners, people who subscribe to the club for the first time? Um, I don't think we have that information, Carsten. No, we have uh, we have taken, uh, as, as usual for such online surveys, a representative sample in terms of age group, in terms of uh, uh, um, male or female. Uh, that is all representative, but we have not asked for the BMI or other, let's say, specific individual data here. And I'm not sure people would be willing to give that. Or BMI. if they know it even. Yeah, no, we have age, uh, we, we have uh, demographics, we have whether they live in a rural or, or a uh, city uh, area. So we have that. So you can see that today, the breakout, the detailed breakout of the consumer study. Linda Ohms asks, membership numbers have increased. Is there a particular subgroup that increased more than others, e.g. by age, gender and income? Awesome. Well, again, I mean, if you uh, take that back to the operators who have uh, increased, especially membership, so the, it was, let's say, outperformed by Basic Fit, uh, who has who have grown by 51% in terms of members in the last year. And if you take the average age here, and uh, I don't think that there's a specific gender to it. I think there are more or less in line with the market, which is probably a bit more female than male and it's like 52 48 percent or even equal and uh, the income of that uh, obviously is um, partly determined by the age so if you see people like uh, in the 30s uh, so they probably have a, let's say average income compared to to the total population i think the the answer is the generation z as uh, as people talk about a lot is, is bounced very strongly back in terms of uh, the increase in the numbers. Um, I think the older population was a bit slower in coming back uh, to the clubs after Corona. 
Um, and in general, men have bounced back more strongly than women uh, after Corona. But overall, we've seen growth in all of the uh, these sectors. And of course, income, uh, I think the, the affordability of fitness is such right now that income is less and less of an issue in terms of making fitness available for everybody uh, with the very low prices that we, we have today. Um, Valeri Giuliani, does Europe Active have a vision and plans to work with its members from non-EU countries, Eastern Partnership countries, to learn more about the current fitness industry environment and future potential there in order to build the proper ecosystem for the European business players interested in those emerging markets? The answer is yes. I know that Europe Active is very uh, busy working with countries in Eastern Europe. We've been very instrumental in helping set up associations in Hungary, in Romania, in uh, Czech, uh, Czech Republic, in Slovakia and other countries. So yes, the answer is Europe Active is very busy in those areas to help put structure uh, in those countries and to pass on learnings from Western Europe to Eastern Europe. So um, the answer is yes, but if Valeri would like to uh, make a specific request, I would suggest you write an email to Carlos Fernandez at Europe Active and, and he, will, he will get back to you. That's a funny one, <laughs> individually. Yeah. Um, question from Georgia Active. Uh, oh, that's from Georgia Active, okay. Um, Joe Garud, will you be able to provide membership volumes and penetration rates by country over time? That's a very good question, uh, Joe. Um, we do have our sort of back of the envelope calculations on country by country penetration. Um, we, we, we do not want, we show it only for those countries where we, where we have reliable data and we do not share it for those where we do not have reliable data. Our objective is with our increased funding in market research to provide next year, hopefully for more countries, a penetration rate um, with, with, with more funding, we will be able to, to give more countries a specific penetration rate. I think that's uh, the fair answer to you to your question. Pierre-Jacques Dachary, do you make specific analyze of the different business model used in the fitness market regarding to the huge specter of segments, which one are the more efficient? I'm not sure that I totally understand the question, but I think Pierre-Jacques, um, the answer is no. That's not, again, the scope of this report. I think there are uh, economic analysis of different business models in the fitness industry and which one is more profitable and which one is uh, less profitable. There are studies to show some of those differences, but we have not included that in our report. Awesome. Any... That's right. But if you refer with respect to a business model to the various pricing points and obviously then related to the size of the clubs, et cetera, I think you can, you can find some information on that when you look at the premium versus the discount operators here. Yeah. Patricia Lopez from To Playbook, Spain. How do you think the price increases impacting demand? Ah, that's a very good question. I think what we've shown today and what you uh, have seen in the reports from those companies that published numbers for the first quarter, that uh, the price uh, increases have gone down relatively well and that members uh, are, are understanding everybody you, me, everybody is seeing price increases for everything you buy, whether it's in the supermarket, whether it's clothing, whether it's your T-Mobile uh, uh, subscription, everything is going up and people understand that also in fitness, the prices can't stay the same with enormous increases in energy. Labor cost in many countries, minimum wages have gone up by 10%. Well, in the fitness industry, we, we don't belong to the ones who pay the highest wages. Uh, but also, I'm sure that for most operators, their wage bill has gone up dramatically. So the answer to your question is, so far, so good. We have seen good acceptance of the higher prices. And uh, what has been confirmed as well by the dealer research, that people are not, at the moment, intend to cut back 
their spendings in terms of fitness clubs. So I would just encourage you, if you look for specific data on specific countries, you can go to the Deloitte webpage and there's the consumer survey free of charge for everybody. You can download the Excel data. You can even look at it at a Tableau reader. So you will have very specific data. Keyword is consumer research, consumer survey here. Yeah. Barbara Smith. Hi, Barbara. Barbara from Fitness News Europe. What are your findings about the number of European clubs that closed permanently last year? And what are your expectations on that for this year? Basically, the number of or percentage of gyms taken out of the market due to the turbulence of the last years. I can say that we have shown you the total number of clubs uh, in the European market, which went up even by 0.5%, so pretty much stable. If you look on it on a country by country basis, some countries we see a decline in the number of clubs, uh, but overall we don't see too much uh, of closings uh, and there were the risk closings, they're compensated by new clubs uh, being opened. Carsten, any, any Yeah, and I think the, the, the financial difficulties caused by the closure of the clubs, which has been partly subsidized by the governments in the various countries, I mean, they're gone now. And what we have seen is that most of the clubs are recording uh, a huge increase in the, in not only in the first quarter, but also from, from last year. So therefore, I see the big wave of insolvencies and enclosures uh, caused by financial instability um, is gone. There's another question from Silvana Delia. Is there any data in the report about the level of physical activity before, during, or after pregnancy? The answer is no. That's not the scope of this report. It's a very good question. I think um, uh, prenatal and postnatal uh, physical activity is, is a very important topic. I know quite a few clubs are, are having special programs for that, but it was not part of our, of our study. Larissa Arario, is there any analysis comments related to the level of investment done needed in current facilities to upgrade, adapt their offering to the new fitness trends? No, 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 that's no. not that specific information. It's not included. It's, it's not in the report, but I can tell you that if you look at the, the, annual reports of stock market listed companies, you will find that all of them have in their uh, financial reserves an amount for refurbishment and upgrade of the facilities. So if you don't do that, you will have facilities that don't look fresh. So it is, it is a, a necessity to do that, but it's not against the scope of this report. But if you go to some of the stock market listed companies, you probably can find in their annual reports and information on what they do in terms of uh, reserving for investment and refurbishment. We are at two minutes before the close of the uh, webinar. And ah, there is another question coming in from Luis Gonzalez. Member data is key, not only for the report, but also for the industry. Can you see a growing focus on member data to increase retention? Would the shown Omnichannel scenario require a bigger focus on tailored omnichannel communication in the future. I can tell you, yes, yes, and yes. Data is key. And um, there is a lot of companies that either have their own generation of data on customer behavior. Uh, how many people is, is a customer coming? What are they doing when they come to the club? Um, incentivize them to, to upgrade some services. There's a lot uh, on data going on. And there is also some very good uh, companies that provide you these services uh, that are in the market. I will not mention a name because then I do this justice to others, but there's some very good companies that provide data management for fitness clubs that you can rely on. So the answer is absolutely without good data, it will be very hard to grow the sector. And it is crucial for the success, future success of our sector to have good, good data. Yeah, and then retail, I mean, uh, also a big sector, which has a lot of B2C um, relationships, uh, they say, uh, who owns the data, owns the customer. And um, I think the positive here is from all these um, after lockdown periods and again reopenings and the creation of all these operating apps. So how many people are in the club, how many people are using this course, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the um, 
the, the exception of data in the clubs has been uh, really risen. And, and I think that's going to be continued as we, as we see it in the future. Yeah. And, and to your question, Louise, on the omni-channel scenario, absolutely. I think, and you, if you look at the, the larger club operators, they all have an omni-channel approach and provide through their apps uh, advice for nutrition, advice for running outside, advice for uh, pregnancy, uh, fitness, uh, you, you, you will see that uh, many, many operators are offering a very, very broad uh, service in terms of helping their uh, customers to be more physically active and to be more healthy. I think we have one last question. Oh, it's a comment. It's a, oh, it's a comment, sorry. Europe Active and European University should work closely with countries like Ukraine, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan to dramatically increase the capacity of fitness professionals by sharing best practices in professional and higher education, including the building proper resources for the physical education. Teachers at schools, Generation Z need modern teachers, coaches and personal instructors in fitness. Thank you all and all the best. Well, thank you very much, Valeri. Um, I can only subscribe to, to that comment and I know Europe Active is very much uh, subscribing to that uh, comment and uh, where we can, we will help and go out in the field with our team at Europe Active to help uh, in those countries to professionalize the sector. And we got the Ukraine live on stage at the FIBO. Yes. So the, that, yeah, was yeah. Breast, that was breathtaking yeah. to see how the people work out in this region. So that was yeah. really uh, amazing to see. Yeah. Yeah. 15.01, it's time to close this uh, webinar. I would like to thank all of you who've been watching. Um, Send in your questions afterwards if you want. We can hopefully, after this webinar, still answer some questions. Thank you for your active uh, participation. And we wish you all a fantastic uh, finish uh, to the, uh, well, the rest of 2023, uh, that it may be, again, a great year. And next year, we hope to be presenting this report again at the EHFF uh, in um, the day before FIBO opens uh, in Cologne. Thank you very much, and good afternoon. Thank you. Stay well and healthy. Stay healthy. Yeah.